the angel appeared and said, you're doing a lot of fiddling around on this one. And God said, have you read the specs on this order? She has to be completely washable, but not plastic. Have 180 movable parts, all replaceable. Run on black coffee and leftovers. Have a lap that disappears when she stands up. A kiss that can cure anything from a broken leg to a disappointed love affair. And six pairs of hands. The angel shook her head slowly and said, Six pairs of hands? No way. Oh, it's not the hands that are causing me problems, God remarked. It's the three pairs of eyes that mothers have to have. That's on the standard model, asked the angel. God nodded. One pair that sees through closed doors when she asks, What are you kids doing in there? When she already knows. Another here in the back of her head that sees what she shouldn't, but what she has to know. And of course, the ones here in front that could look at a child when he goofs up and say, I understand and I love you, without so much as uttering a word. God, said the angel, touching his sleeve gently, get some rest. Tomorrow, I can't, said God. I'm so close to creating something so close to myself. Already I have one who heals herself when she is sick, can feed a family of six on one pound of hamburger, and can get a nine-year-old to stand under a shower. The angel circled the, mother, the model of a mother very slowly. It's too soft, she sighed. But tough, said God excitedly. You can imagine what this mother can do or endure. Can it think? Not only can it think, but it can reason and compromise, said the Creator. Finally, the angel bent over and ran a finger across the cheek. There's a leak, she pronounced. I told you that you were trying to put too much into this model. It's not a leak, said the Lord. It's a tear. What's it for? It's for joy, sadness, disappointment, pain, loneliness, and pride. You are a genius, said the angel. Somebody, God said, I didn't put it there. Shall we just bow for a moment? Our Father, we just want to say thank you that we can celebrate this very special day, the mothers that you have given to us. And Lord, we can only say thank you. Thank you for our mothers. And as we consider again the impact that mothers have had on the children's lives that mothers have had on each one of our lives, then we can only say thank you. Amen. Do you know where Mother's Day started? The way we celebrate it to today? Well, it's only about 114 years old. In 1908, a spinster named Anna Jarvis wanted to have a celebration to honor a mother who had died uh, three years previously. And uh, she went to a store owner, called John Wan Wanamaka, and asked him to help finance this special celebration. And he saw in it a wonderful opportunity to attract people to his store. Well, Anna Jarvis organized this celebration in the Methodist Church in West Virginia, and John Wanamaka got, a, a, I think, over a thousand people into his retail stores to celebrate it. And it made such an impact that other churches in West Virginia started doing that. And when Anna Jarvis saw the success that it had, she started campaigning for it to become a public holiday. Wrote letters, wrote to the newspapers, wrote to governors. And finally, in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson declared Mother's Day as a national holiday to be celebrated on the second Sunday in May. And that's where... We, it started the way we celebrate it today. And I think it's right that we celebrate mothers because they have a huge impact on their children. I would like all the mothers just to remain seated and everybody else to please stand up who's not a mother. Right, now will you please give all the mothers a standing ovation. Thank you. Mothers have a major impact on their children. Mothers are associated with loving, caring, nurturing. And it's very interesting, you know, God is neither male nor female, but he is to present it to us in Scripture as a father. Yet in Isaiah 66 verse 13, the Lord says, I will comfort you there in Jerusalem as a mother 
comforts her child because motherhood is associated with comfort, with caring, with loving. Some years ago, before the time of cell phones, they did an experiment in a state penitentiary back in the United States that on Mother's Day, every prisoner was allowed to make a phone call of one minute long to his mother. Well, they queued up in lines that was around the blocks, each one waiting to be able to call his mother. And because of the success of that, on Father's Day, they decided to do the same thing. One prisoner phoned his father. Nobody else. And it tells me again that even a hardened criminal cannot escape and cannot forget the love of a mother. There's been a great deal of research done on the impact that mothers have on especially the physical development of their children, particularly in an early age. I just want to mention two of them. Both were done in the year conducted in the year 2020. They discovered that the brain size of three-year-old children who had a loving mother was significantly larger than the brain size of three-year-olds who were left on their own. So it actually has a physical impact on the child. In the other study, via neuroscanning, they found out that a mother's emotional state, when it's positive, she connects actually with the baby's brain and is able to influence the baby in a far greater detail just by her emotional mood. In 1977, there was a British court case where a mother was found guilty of gross neglect. You see, she wanted to raise her children naturally. And so what she did, she looked after them physically, fed them, you know, clothed them, everything else, but did not interact with them and sh showed them no affection. Well, her one-year-old little boy could not yet sit upright. The two-year-old little girl could not speak. She could only grunt. That's the impact that emotional caring of a mother has on a child. But what about the spiritual impact of a mother? You know, it's very interesting to me. If you read through the book of Kings, where it reads about all the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, their devotion to the Lord was often linked to their mother's name. Let me just give you two of them. It says in 2 Kings 15, Jotham, his mother's name was Jerusha, daughter of Zadok. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And then in 2 Kings 21, Manasseh, his mother's name was Hephzibah, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. In fact, he became the most evil king that Judah ever had. And, I, and this is said about all the kings, and I wondered, is there a link between the mother and the devotion of these kings to the Lord? Did you know that a child's faith is the strongest between the ages of three to five? And that tells me that mothers have the greatest opportunity to lead their children to Christ. My wife Joy led all three of our children to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ before the age of six. And now 40 plus years later, all three of them are still walking with the Lord. And throughout history, there have been thousands of great, yes, and terrible mothers. I'm going to tell you about four of them, and let's start with the bad ones. Have you ever heard of Agrippina? Who's heard of Agrippina? No, none of Oh, one person. Yes, all right. Well done, Lindsay. She was the wife of Emperor Claudius, who reigned from the year AD 41 onwards. And she was described as ruthless, ambitious, violent, and domineering. Guess who her son was? Nero, the cruelest emperor of all time. Remember, he was supposed to have fiddled while Rome burned? He persecuted Christians like no other emperor had ever persecuted Christians. He had them crucified in the driveway to his palace. And then when he arrived in his chariot, they would be set alight so they could light the way for him to drive through. That's the kind of son a mother like that produces. In fact, at the time of Nero's persecution of the Christians, they actually ran out of wood to make enough crosses. And then there was Catherine Gordon. Anybody heard of Catherine Gordon? 
her biographer said, no, she was the mother of the person that we know as Lord Byron, the poet. But he was tempestuous, he was notorious, he was scandalous. He was an extremely immoral man. And his biographer said, he took off to his equally formidable mother. That's the impact that a mother can have on the spiritual and moral values of a child. Now, let me tell you about two good mothers. There was Susanna. Her family, she had a large family, and they lived in poverty. They had lots of disease in their home. Their house burned down once. She experienced death. She had 17 children, seven of them who died. She buried them. Can you imagine? I mean, any one mother losing a child is terrible. To lose seven of them? Her husband was often away from home. She had to cope on her own. Yet she was a godly woman, and throughout all her trials, she remained strong in her faith. She couldn't have find a place to have a quiet time in a home with so many children, so she would sit in a kitchen, put her apron over her head, and the children knew when she had her apron over her head, you don't make a noise because mom is talking to the Lord. I don't know what happened to her other children, but her two most famous sons were John Wesley, one of the greatest preachers this world has known, and Charles Wesley, one of the greatest hymn writers that the world has ever known. And then there was Monica, and I'm sure you've never heard of Monica. Not the one I'm talking about. Her husband frequently committed adultery. Can you imagine a woman having to live with that? Yet she remained a godly woman. She was known for a prayer life that was particularly devoted to the salvation of her son. But her son initially followed his dad's footsteps. He was an incredibly immoral man. But she persevered. And eventually, his mother's prayers prevailed. And her son became one of the greatest theologians in the Christian faith. We know him as St. Augustine. That's the impact that mothers can have, for good or for bad. And it's interesting, these last two women both had circumstances that were extremely difficult. Yet they chose not to become victims and to start feeling sorry for themselves. And I think mothers are the unsung heroes of our community. We should build statues for them, especially single mothers, because they carry double the burden. Well, what about mothers in the Bible? And I just want to mention a few of them. And the first is Jochebed. Who's that? Well, she was a slave in Egypt. And she had a, boy, a girl and a boy. But by the time her third child was born, the orders had been given that all Hebrew baby boys were to be put to death. So she hid him for three months. And when she could no longer conceal him, she made a little basket, waterproofed it, and put him, the baby, on the Nile. And you know the story well. Pharaoh's daughter came along, found it, and this sister of Moses, Miriam, must have been a very sharp girl because in an instant she ran to Pharaoh's daughter and said, can I find a nurse for you to look after the baby? And so Jochebed had the opportunity to spend perhaps six years with Moses before he was taken to the palace to start his formal education. And in this, those six years, she must have instilled in him a very, very strong sense of identity with God's people. Because at the age of 40, he rejected his royal status and all his privileges and identified himself with this slave nation. And he became a truly great man of God. And you know the story well, how he led Israel out of Egypt and he wrote the first five books of the Bible. Then there was Hannah. And she was barren. Her husband's other wife had many children and looked down on Hannah. Can you imagine having to live in that situation? But Hannah waited on the Lord. Always a tough thing to do. And she earnestly prayed. And God answered her and gave her a son. And again, she raised him up in those first few critical years of a child's life. And then she sent him off to serve in the tabernacle. And her son Samuel became again one of the greatest prophets in Scripture. 
and he ruled over Israel at a time when they had no king. And the Lord, by the way, honored her with more children after that. But it tells me again the impact that a mother can have on a child in those first few critical years. And then there was Liz. I think she was known as Elizabeth. She was also barren. She was past childbearing age. But then the Lord gave her a son. And they called him John. John the Baptist. And that wasn't because he belonged to our denomination, by the way. And you know what Jesus said of John the Baptist? Among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. And I wonder what role Elizabeth played in the life of John. She must have told him about the coming Messiah that everybody was expecting at that time. She must have told him about what the angel had said to his father Zacharias and the prophecies that had been made about him. And John, as Jesus said, became a great man as he prepared the way for Messiah. And then there were two other mothers, Lois and Eunice. Lois was a woman of sincere faith, Scripture tells us, and she had passed it on to her daughter, Eunice. Eunice was married to an unbeliever. And it's always very, very tough for a believing wife to have an unbelieving husband. Yet despite that, she raised a son to put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Timothy became Paul's right-hand man. And after Paul's death, Timothy became a great leader in his own right in the early church. And then, of course, the most famous mother of all, Mary. Think about it. God could have come to earth as a grown man, but he didn't. He chose to come as a baby and to entrust his earthly upbringing to a young poor woman. I say poor in the sense of that she was not very wealthy. Can you mention being trusted with having to raise God himself? And yet she willingly obeyed, even though her fiancé almost dumped her. The community spread rumors about her immorality. And she probably was also a single mother of at least seven children. They may have, she may have had more, we don't know, but she had at least seven children. And why do I say that she was probably a, a single mother? Well, after Jesus' visit to the temple at the age of 12, we no longer hear of Joseph. And at the wedding in Cana, Mary came on her own. And she must have often doubted. What if I mess up? And I think many parents, not just mothers, fathers too, I certainly have. What if we mess up? But she didn't. And she clearly had a lot of confidence in her son. For example, at the wedding of Cana, Jesus had never ever done a miracle yet. And yet she said to those servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And it just highlights again the need and the importance when mothers instill their confidence in children. I had dealings years ago with a man who was very successful but told me that his father always criticized him. His father always belittled him. His father always said to him, you will never amount to anything. And I said to him, but, you know, how come you've turned out so well? And he said to me, my mother believed in me. And that made all the difference. But you know, Mary also experienced pain that I think only a mother can feel. At the time of Jesus' dedication, you may recall, Simeon prophesied that a sword would pierce Mary's soul. And that is exactly what she must have experienced. Maybe, remember at the time when Jesus was 12 and they went to Jerusalem and then he went missing? For three days they searched for him. And I think Joseph would have said, I don't worry, he'll be okay. You know, typical like dads would say, I doubt if he slept very much in those three days. 
And what about when Jesus' brothers rejected him? Mary was caught in the middle, and mothers are often in that situation, aren't they? The beginning of this year, I had to mediate a family, a farming family, where the father and the son, an adult son, had just major conflict. And the mother was right in the middle. And having to handle both sides. That's pain. But ultimately the greatest pain and the sword pierced her soul was when she saw her son hanging on that cross. And it just seems that mothers seem to feel the pain when their children are going through suffering so much more than dads do. And they can identify with Mary. I certainly, Joy feels much stronger than I do. She feels the pain much stronger when our children are going through difficult times than I do. So, what conclusion can we come to? Mothers are amazing people, and I think they need to hear it. And a small child cannot say to a mother, Oh, mom, you're terrific. You know, the meals you prepare, the trouble you go to, the sacrifices you make for us. No, they just say, Mom, I've got to be at music lesson this afternoon at three, you know, and mom's just got to jump. And so I want to close this message with a, a strong recommendation that you write a tribute to your mother. One of the key commandments, honor your father and your mother. It's repeated eight times in scripture. And write that tri tribute to your mother now. Don't wait for her funeral. My mother was a tough lady. She survived the Nazi occupation in Holland for five years. At one time she had to flee to the countryside with three small little girls. My dad was away, he was fighting in the underground. She had to carry a suitcase and three small children, so she had them in a harness, so you know, on a leash. And um, in those at that time when she had to flee, in two nights, she went completely white. Overnight. She was a tough lady. By the way, all three of those little girls are now in their 80s. And one of them is with us this morning. <laughs> I cannot recall. Why have I told you this? Because I cannot recall ever having seen my mother cry. She was just tough. But... Some years before she died, I wrote out a tribute to her. As you can see, it's a nice paper. I had it framed, and I presented this to her. And for the first time in my life, I saw my mother cry. Do you realize again how important it is for mothers to hear that we value them? In February this year, Joy received a most unusual gift for her birthday. Our 21-year-old granddaughter said to her, Grammy, I don't want you to die and I hope you'll be with me for a long time, but if you were to die tomorrow, this is what I would say at your funeral. And she sent Joy a tribute. Wow. Wow. You say, yeah, but my mother has already passed away. Well, you can still write her a letter. And you keep that letter and read it every now and then and thank the Lord for it. Even if she wasn't a good mother, she gave you life. Joy's mother, Grace, died when she was three years old. And Joy cannot remember much about her. But about 50 years after she died, we sat next to her graveside in Bulawayo. And Joy wrote her a four-page letter. And the next day she went back, again at the graveside. And this time the letter was, and she wrote another letter, and I think it was only two pages. And then, and then she wrote a third letter which was relatively short. And finally, Joy had closure. Years later she wrote a similar letter to her stepmother, Noreen, after she had died. And then she actually said, Lord, won't you tell my stepmother 
how much I loved her. Can I urge you to do the same for your mother today? Shall we pray? Our Father, we will never know the impact that our mothers had on our lives. And we come this morning again just to say thank you to you for giving us our mothers. And Lord, we want to pray for every mother here today that you will encourage her, that you will just lift her up, that you will just show her again that her labor of love and her years of sacrifice were not in vain. Amen.